And we are going to be looking at God's Word. Uh, John's going to come and uh, shortly be preaching to us from Genesis chapter 15. Uh, but before he does that, Beth is going to come and read to us uh, from Hebrews chapter 6. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. The reading is from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 20, and that can be found on pages, uh, page 1205. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said, and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that, by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Beth. And uh, do note there, just that theme of God's certain promise, the hope that it brings, and that enables us to be patient uh, as time now is hard. Now, I've done some more handouts because we've been without for young ones. So, Beth, can I give you these to give out? <clears throat> you want a handout, do pop up your hands, particularly young people, and uh, Beth will give you one. And I can't promise a prize, but if you do fill it all in and you want to show me at the end, I'd love to see that. But we're working through uh, Abraham's life in the book of Genesis at the moment. So do turn to Genesis 15, would you? To Genesis 15. And last time we heard how, in God's strength, he defeated various kings to rescue Lot. And when he was tempted with all what we call the booty, the goods that he had taken, he didn't want any of it because he wanted only to rely on the Lord to give him what he had. We're going to pick the story up in Genesis chapter 15 and I'm going to read the whole chapter out to us. But let's pray before we look at it. Father, we do pray as we come to your word now. As always, we need your help. Help me to communicate, communicate it rightly and help us as we listen to receive it rightly, that the Lord Jesus would be known in our hearts and honoured in our lives. For his sake, amen. Well, Genesis chapter 15 then. After all this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, You've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Well, then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abraham said, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. 
Abraham brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. And then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. And when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking firepot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land, from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites and Jebusites. So says God's word. I bet you're pleased we didn't ask you to do that reading, aren't you? Okay. Just think for a moment uh, whether you've ever been anxious or unsettled when waiting for a lift. So this might be something that resonates with you. Perhaps you're waiting outside school for mum or dad to come and pick you up and there's a bunch of kids very close to you that you know don't like you and pick on you so you're a little bit fearful. Or perhaps you're in town or perhaps even up in London and you're waiting to get picked up and it's dark and people are starting to fall out of the pubs and it makes you worried. You're going to feel two emotions. Fear of what could happen and frustration that your mum and dad are taking their time and they're not there to pick you up. <coughs> well, look, it can be the same when it comes to the return of Christ. You know, in this present age, this side of heaven, we can get fearful. It might be regular sufferings. You see it happening to other people and you worry that one day it's going to happen to you. Maybe it's things getting sticky in the workplace. Gav mentioned a little bit of that earlier. Sometimes Christians do find it particularly hard in their workplaces. Uh, and even when it's not, perhaps you worry that it might be soon. Maybe it's fear for our children, the impact our society is going to have on them, whether they're going to have enough when they grow up. Or maybe it's geopolitical fears, you know, just when we're sort of rather tired about the war in Ukraine, suddenly war in Israel. What could it mean? Kids, we're told that your generation is apparently one of the most anxious that there's been. So a lot of people will talk about you guys growing up and saying, you know, at school everyone goes on about global warming all the time, everyone goes on about having to get a good job so you can provide for yourself because the cost of living is high, everyone goes on about social media and all these things. So you end up just more anxious than previous generations were. We all grew up sort of slightly oblivious to what's going on. But you're not, so you can end up fearful. But look, with this fear can also come frustration, can't it, that Christ hasn't come back yet, or if not that, that we're not seeing more of his perfect kingdom in the present. You know, do you ever long just to see a little bit more frustration as we see uh, our culture that seemed in the past to have a little more acknowledgement of Christ in a sort of moral degeneration with all the brokenness that we see around us, or frustration at seeing the church that should be standing firm and honouring Jesus actually being very weak and capitulating. <coughs> Fear and frustration. We long for Jesus to come back and we have to live with the realities of now. Look, that's not new. Okay? The nation of Israel felt that fear and frustration all the way through their history as they were oppressed by one nation after the other. Fear of what might be. Frustration that God's promise to Abraham that we've been looking at hadn't yet been fulfilled. When are you going to be blessing Abraham's descendants, Lord? When are we, Israel, going to become this blessing to the world? Well, if you ever feel those things, and I think we all do to some extent, there is such encouragement from God's word for us today. Two things. If you feel fearful, 
and frustrated, all right? So great stuff for our souls. First thing, really nice and simple, we need to come back to God's word at those times. The point here, kids, is that when we feel like this, we need to come back to the Bible and be reminded that God is with us and he is for us. So if you're filling in those boxes and it says, write down the key points, this is one to write down there. It's true, isn't it, that if you're in that dark place and you're waiting for mum or dad to come and pick you up, you're not going to be as fearful if your other parent is actually with you at the time. That's the point here. Think back to last week. Abraham's just defeated this bunch of kings. He's rejected the booty that he uh, essentially won from them. And so our chapter begins with Abraham a little bit fearful. It seems he's worried they might come back. He's worried that having rejected all those goods, is he going to have what he needs? Well, look at verse 1 and do have a look down. Just see it in the Bible for yourself. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in, in this vision where it's as if he's hearing God. What a great phrase that is. The word of the Lord came. What comforting words those are. The word of the Lord comes to us when we're fearful and frustrated. One of the great tragedies in pastoral ministry is that when you see people in the church hitting crisis, what they tend to do is they pull back from church. They go into themselves. They keep everyone away. See? It must really delight the devil. It's the worst possible thing you can do. Because when you're struggling, what you need is you need a word from God. And God's word comes to us through his people at church, as we preach and as we teach one another. And look at what that word is to Abraham. Verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, Do not be afraid. Why? I am your shield, your very great reward. If you're fearful, God says, look, don't be afraid. He doesn't say, because bad stuff doesn't happen. He says, don't be afraid, because I am your shield and your very great reward. Gloriously, God assures him and us that he is the two things we need. He's our shield, our protection. He's our reward, our provision. Just picture, just picture yourself walking through life, living inside a sort of spherical force field that either keeps bad stuff off you or sort of transforms it into working for good as it comes through that field. Well, that's what it is to have God as our shield in life. Or, or imagine yourself with a larder at home that whatever you take out, suddenly it reappears there. There's an unlimited amount of resource there. Well, this is our God, isn't it, who possesses the earth. There is no limit in what he might provide. So we never need to reject doing what we learned last week in rejecting. We never, we never need to regret rejecting the things of this world that might entice us as those things that Abraham won in the war might have enticed him. The romance with that non-Christian person that may not be helpful for our faith. The flash of car or holiday or extra time, whatever it might be that we would rather have. Well, none of that is comparable with having the Lord, is it? Just think of these words from Psalm 16. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. Praise Church, he is our shield. He gives security to us. He is our reward, our portion. It's all we need. John Piper once wrote a book, the American pastor, called God is the Gospel. The point is that the primary thing faith gives us is not actually that forgiveness of our sins or that place in the kingdom. Think about it this way. The primary thing that the living God gives you and me if we're Christians is himself. He says to Abraham, I am your shield, your very great reward. We have God. And Romans 8, 31 and 32, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, 
graciously give us all things. What we need to hear again and again and again from God when we're feeling fearful or frustrated, when life's difficult, is that in Christ, God has given us himself. Think a little bit about the fact that life's hard in a moment, but let's first recognize that he is our shield. He is our very great reward. We're not wanting. Well, Abraham believes, but his faith is shaky. In what follows, he wonders what God will give to fulfill his promise, because Abraham's got no descendants at this point, so how is he going to be a great nation? He's had to make even a servant his heir because he has no son. And so he moves from that fear to the frustration. He's frustrated that God's not moving on his promises. He's not delivering. There is delay. And so often we need a repeated word of God, don't we, when our faith is floundering. And that's just what he has. Have a look at verse 4. It's that same phrase. Then the word of the Lord came. Can you see? It's always what we need when we're struggling. We need a word from God. The word of the Lord comes for the second time to Abraham. And it comes with great promise. He takes him out into the night in a place where there's no light pollution at all. And Abraham looks up and all he can see is the Milky Way and the galaxies spanning the heavens. God says, look up, Abraham. I know you and Sarah are getting old. I know she's barren. She can't have children. But can you count them? That's going to be the amount of offspring that I'm going to give you. This is our God, isn't it? From the death of age and inability to have children, God will bring billions upon billions of descendants of Abraham by biology or by faith. Isn't that astonishing? So I don't for a minute doubt that from the death of a Middle Eastern man on a Roman cross, he's unable to bring about an innumerable amount of people, his children, to populate a new heavens and an earth. That's what God does. Well, every night Abraham's faith would have been bolstered. You can imagine him living outdoors and lying on the ground and looking up and just remembering every day a reminder of what God has promised to him. And as we look up and we see the stars, we can remember that as well because, you know, I know it's a bit cheesy, I guess, but we're there, aren't we? You know, one of those stars, that, that's us. We're children of Abraham if we've believed in his greatest descendant, the Lord Jesus. So that reminds us of this great multitude that God is bringing about, but he's given us something else to help us remember. It may feel a bit less significant, but it's the Lord's Supper, isn't it? That's the primary place as Christians that we remember. For us, every time we come and we eat and we drink, we're proclaiming Christ's death, as the Bible puts it, until he comes again. We're remembering. And that coming around the table together is a, a little image of the great feast that we're looking forward to, where each of us will feast as stars in the galaxy of God's kingdom. And the point for us is this, look, when you are fearful and frustrated in the, the difficulties of this present time as we wait patiently for what is to come, we must return to God's word studied in the scriptures and pictured for us in communion, the Lord's Supper. And we must remember then what we have, you see. And by that means our faltering faith, it gets strengthened. And just look at verse 6. Abraham, seeing the stars and hearing God speak, this is how many offspring you'll have, verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now, if you're new to Christian things, this verse contains within it all the treasures of the gospel, the good news about Jesus. I want to try and explain it to you very briefly. You know, by believing in the promise of a particular descendant that was going to bring blessing to the world, Abraham is sort of BC looking ahead to Jesus. We're AD looking back to Jesus, but we're both believing in the same thing of what God has promised in this son. And as we come to faith, and we've defined that as trusting God by trusting what he says, 
as we trust his word of promise about Jesus, about him being God's son who died and rose so we could be forgiven and given eternal life, as we believe that, well, just as verse 6 says, God credits righteousness to us. Let me explain what that means. To be righteous is to always do right in upholding God's law. And what the gospel of Jesus says is that when we put our confidence in him, we cling to Jesus, his status of having always perfectly obeyed God is credited to our account, just like a whole mass of money might be put into yours. So despite the fact that you and I are very clearly not righteous, we are declared as righteous in God's court. And so we never need to fear a judgment day because he says, you, you, you and you, you are righteous in my eyes. And what that means is no matter how much of a mess of things we make, and Abraham does make some mess, we need not fear God's judgment because we are counted as if we'd always lived the perfect life, the life of Jesus. Do you see? It is an astonishing verse. Abraham simply believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He counted him as acceptable in his sight forever. But the thing to get here is that such faith is only genuine if we persevere in it as we hear God's word again and again. That's what's happening here. Abraham's believed God previously, but he's faltering and he hears God's word and he keeps on believing. Only then, if we believe today and we believe tomorrow, we keep on believing. Only if we are trusting Jesus can we say, God is my shield and my very great reward. One of my uh, precious memories with the kids when they were young, uh, every now and again I try it, but it's not quite so good as they get older, is having them on my back as I climb up the stairs. So they will climb on my back, and I'm sort of on all fours coming up the stairs, and sometimes we play gorillas and stuff like that. But if I could feel them starting to fall on my back, well, particularly when they're young, I'm worried about them falling and hurting themselves. So I say, no, hold tight, hold tight. And I could feel them hold tighter to me, and that's fine, and I'll climb up the stairs to the top. Well, look, that's how we persevere in our faith, isn't it? You know, it's not, I can be good enough or religious enough to get myself to heaven. No one can. We are unrighteous. But if we cling to Jesus, he is our righteousness, and therefore we will get to heaven on his back. But every now and again, when things are hard, we start to let go. And then we need God's word again coming to us saying, no, hold tighter. Keep holding on. And by that means, he ensures we do. And so he keeps on carrying us to glory. Like Abraham, we need God to speak to us. To keep on speaking to us. Colossians 1, and 23, God has reconciled you to himself if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. So let me ask you again, you know, uh, are you fearful or frustrated uh, in this present time with how things are as we wait for the time to come and Christ's return? Kids, do you find it hard being a Christian and sometimes you just feel your hold on Jesus, you're just starting to let go of him, you're wondering whether to just let go and go your own way. Well, don't let go. Come back again to God's word and hear him say, now hold tighter. Hold tighter to my promises. I think it's true to say that because our modern living is perhaps busier than it has been for so long with many of us you know in our families we're all having to work and just at kind of 24 7 work and at the same time when we're exhausted entertainment is there to just sap every other moment isn't it i think it's a lot harder for us to be serious about the word of god than it was for christians in years gone by you know when they get to the evening well there wasn't a huge amount to do as the lights went down and so they would open God's word or talk about it if they were real believers. We've got to make time for God's word. 
because it is his means of sustaining us in faith. Yes, to meditate on it at home, but especially to be here in church, to be in a community group or at Salt, to be in the Christian Union. We need to hear again and again what the God is for us in Christ, don't we? We need to hear again and again so that we keep on holding firmly to Jesus. We need to repeatedly see the Lord's Supper to help our faith to feed on Jesus once more. And as it does, and as our grip is tightened, then we can rejoice at all we have in God's promises. So the first thing today is, look, when we're struggling with things, look, return to God's word. That's what you need. As Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life to us. But there's a second point here as well, and that is to remember God's covenant. Kids, this means remembering that God has committed to give us what he's promised, but to do it his way and not ours. And this is where we're going to start to deal with the fact that actually despite saying, yeah, God is my shield and my very great reward, the fact is that doesn't mean life is always going to be easy for us. And God in this passage helps us to see that very clearly. Time means we have to go quickly. Abraham is still in need of reassurance. Look down at verse 8. Again, he says, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I'm going to gain possession of this, this great land that he's promised him? And again, God speaks, doesn't he? Verse 9. Now, a covenant. A covenant is a binding agreement between God and people, okay? So marriage is the covenant we often think about, where there is a commitment of faithfulness till death us do part, and the stipulation is that we would stay faithful. Well, God makes covenants with his people, and here with Abraham where he promises things to Abraham on the uh, stipulation of faithfulness. And the covenant ceremony is worked out by telling Abraham to get a bunch of animals that he has to cut in half. It's a bit harsh, I know, but that's the point. Uh, and the ancient ceremony was one in which both parties would walk between these animals, if you can picture them, cut in half, and the sense was that the two parties would walk between them, and if one of them broke the covenant then let it be to them as it's been to the animals. Do you see? Well, that night, from verse 12, God causes Abraham to fall into a, a deep sleep in which he reveals that actually God's way of bringing about his promise is going to be through a degree of hardship. He tells them from verse 13 onwards that his descendants are going to spend 400 years enslaved and mistreated in a foreign country. That's their time in Egypt. And although that nation would then be punished as they were through the plagues, only after that 400 years is God going to bring them up when the time is right and bring them to their promised land. But having told him that, something amazing happens. Look at verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking firepot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. You see what's happening? God is walking between the animals. And Abraham isn't. So God is saying, look, this covenant, I'm going to make it just dependent on me. And if there's any breaking of it, well, let it be to me as it has been to these animals. What grace in God to find a way of making a promise that ultimately is dependent on him and not on us. The point is that we all feel the tension, don't we, between declaring God is our shield and our reward in our day-to-day -day experience, which so often doesn't feel like that. And in God's covenant with Abraham and his covenant with us in Christ, he tells us, no, 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 I'm committed to this. I will bring it about. But you've got to remember, it's doing my way and not yours. For Abraham's descendants, that meant they would go through the death experience of slavery in Egypt before coming to the life experience of being taken to the land. For Christ himself, it meant he went through the death experience of his death on the cross before the life experience of resurrection. And for you and me, we follow Jesus, and it's going to mean through a death experience of struggle with this world before the life experience of being brought in to the world to come. And so there's three things to learn from this covenant ceremony that Abraham sees in his dream for us today. 
And I hope they will encourage you. First is that God's purpose for us as Christians, it will include hardship. He shaped Israel's history to be a pattern of ours. So verse 13, look at the detail. Israel were foreigners, enslaved and afflicted when in Egypt. Well, does it ever feel for you like you're a bit of a foreigner in your own country or in your own workplace or your own school? You just feel you don't fit. Well, that's because in some ways you don't. You're someone who belongs to the kingdom to come and not the kingdom of this world. Sometimes it can feel like we're still enslaved as we're afflicted by the things of the world around us that are anti-God. Let's not be surprised like that. We're not yet at our Canaan of God's kingdom. But second note here that God's wisdom is nevertheless going to become evident in time. It's interesting to note in verse 14, isn't it, that in the end there will be justice on those who oppressed God's people and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. Famously, the Egyptians gave them stuff so that Israel, as they left, had a whole load of wealth to help them to be the nation that they were. Well, Jesus' return is taking a long time. But he too has said, look, where there is oppression, there will be justice. And actually, you will come out with great possessions as well. What's meant by that? Well, in some sense, it's, as Jesus said, the meek will inherit the earth in the end. In the kingdom of God, it's this earth made new. But I think there's also a sense in which, as we go through our struggles, isn't it true that every one of them somehow fits us for the life to come? You know, the difficulties we, we're going through that seem so present to us, they're shaping the personality that we're going to have when we get to heaven. We're gaining memories of how we struggled, but God proved faithful. How we prayed and God answered. How he brought us, perhaps, in, in months, perhaps, in years, perhaps in decades, through that difficult time, and then he did bring us through. And we'll carry those memories on into the world to come. Above all, we will remember God's grace to us. The older I get as a Christian, the more aware I am of just how sinful I am within me and how utterly gracious God is to tolerate me and more than that, uh, to actually bless me. And all those experiences I'm going to take into glory and uh, unless I was the mess that I am, I would not appreciate God's grace in that way. And who knows what other developments of our time on this earth we're going to carry over when we inherit it beyond death. The point is we need to trust that God knows what he's doing. Just as Abraham had to trust that God knew what he was doing in bringing his descendants into Egypt. But third we need to see here also that God's timing is going to be proved perfect. Look at verse 16. It was in that fourth generation when the Israelites would come back to Canaan and the reason is that the people living in Canaan were not yet sinful enough to warrant their destruction by the Israelites in judgment. Now, when you get to some of those passages in the Old Testament where the Canaanite peoples are being destroyed, they're quite hard ones, aren't they, for us? This verse is quite helpful. God wouldn't have that happen until their sin was so appalling that it warranted it. And we know from ancient history that all sorts of appalling things were done, including child sacrifice. But the point is that God knows what he's doing in his timing. It's not all about me and how I would like things to work out. He's got a bigger picture that I'm not always party to. Again, 2 Peter 3.9. In terms of Christ's return, Peter writes, Lord isn't slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. In other words, God's delay of 2,000 years is not because he doesn't know what he's doing and he wants us to go through great hardships all the time. It's because he's got more people he wants to bring to faith. It's in his time and not ours. Well, God often brings a, uses a great drama to bring his purposes home, the drama of looking up at the skies and here the drama of the dream uh, and what was revealed to Abraham. For us, it's the drama of a cross, isn't it? Not the, as it was called, a cutting of a covenant with animals, but a cutting of a covenant on that cross. And as we look at the cross, we should find our faith being renewed. 
Verse 12. Abraham is asleep in deep darkness. The only light comes from the flame of God walking between those pieces. As you feel life is one of darkness, don't miss the light of God that is your hope. He is your shield and your reward. That doesn't mean life's always going to be easy. He's got a bigger picture of what he's doing, but his light is there. Trust in him. He'll get you through. Well, before we finish, I just want to mention one verse to you that brings all this together. We've basically got God's two words to Abraham of who he is as shield and reward and what he promises of eventual inheritance of the land. And in the middle is verse 6 and that word of faith. Isaiah says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. God's word to us today is quite simple. It's that his word will bring about faith and with faith then comes peace as we struggle with this present time. When fearful, when frustrated at what goes on around us, at what is at work within you or what we see in the church, trust in the Lord. Tell yourself whatever comes it's come to me by God's wisdom and God's timing. It comes to prove or to grow or display my faith to others and to fit me somehow for glory. Tell yourself, I know that having chosen this for me and for those I love, my God is sufficient as our shield and as our reward to enable us to cope. And he will one day compensate us for everything in the reward and joy we will receive from Christ at his return. And guys, can I say, when you compare the present struggle with what we will know then, there is no comparison at all. Let's determine this week to come forth as Abraham did, as gold, trusting the Lord and therefore knowing this peace that he gives. A moment of quiet, a chance for you to respond with your own prayer, and then I'll pray for us and we're going to sing. But let's, let's have a moment of quiet for your own prayer before we do. Father, we thank you so much that in your grace to us, with Abraham, we can say that you are our shield and our very great reward. That with Abraham, we can look forward to a day when we will shine as stars in your coming kingdom. But Father, we confess we find it hard along the way. And Father, we pray that you would help us to be serious about Christ. <coughs> that we would wholeheartedly trust in him, cling to him. And when things are hard, we would ensure that we are hearers of your word, that our faith might be bolstered and this peace might come. Father, we pray for those amongst our number, even here today, that we know have been dealt a much more difficult hand than many of us. Father, would you grant them the grace that they need for this time. Grant to them that deep conviction of your word that leads to strong faith and toward this perfect peace. And Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.